Christmas is a wonderful time of the year, isn't it? A lot of activities and parties and programs and all kinds of things that go on, but Christmas also can be a very stressful time, a time of loneliness, a time of, of grief because a loved one is no longer with us. I was surprised this Christmas as we were gathered with family and having a wonderful time. I, I felt a little melancholy, a little bit of loneliness since I'd lost my dear friend Ira this year, and I, I just I wondered how many others have felt a little bit of that this year with mom being gone or or husband, or wife, or, or friend. And yet, with, with that, there's something special about Christmas. Even though it means a lot of gatherings, and parties, and elaborate meals, and long trips, and hosting family members, and trying to do the laundry, and all of the things that go along with it. And yet, with all of the, the things that Christmas bring, often instead of bringing joy, Christmas can bring a lot of frustration if you allow it. Christmas can, can, can bring a lot of difficulty if you focus on the wrong thing. I heard about a woman who was shopping, and it was a busy time to be out shopping, kind of like it was these past few weeks. And she was in a mall, and she was just exhausted from, from dealing with the crowds and, and trying to maneuver her way down the aisles to find the, the perfect gift. And she had her arms full of, of bags and boxes, and she came up to an elevator, and the elevator opened, and, and it was full. And she said, oh, great. And she saw what was going on, and the people in the elevator kind of saw her frustration and graciously kind of pushed to the side and made a little bit of room. And she got into the elevator frustrated. And as the elevator doors closed, she said, I just, I just wish that the person who thought up this holiday would be, would be put in jail and, and strung up and, and hung. And the people that were gathered there kind of nodded their head in agreement a little bit until somebody in the back of the elevator said he already was. He died for us. You know, Christmas, if we look at the wrong things, we can miss out on the true meaning that this God who so loved the world gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We've been looking at the last several weeks um, uh, Christmas carols and talking about what it means to, to love God and, and what these carols tell us about who God is. And today I want to look at my Christmas playlist and we're going to look at Joy to the World. And I know it's after Christmas, but, but Joy to the World has such a significant place in, in our lives as believers and as the church. We know it, we love it, we sing the songs, and I pray that as you hear these songs in the future, as you sing these songs, that you will remember some of these messages, some of these insights about what they tell about God and our relationship with Him. Joy to the World was written nearly 300 years ago. In four years, it will celebrate its 300th anniversary. And it was written by a man by the name of Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts was the author of about 750 hymns, just a prolific writer, an amazing man of God. And he's called the father of hymnology or the father of, of hymns due to his popularity with the English hymns that he's written. And maybe you know some of the other hymns that he's written, Come Ye That Love the Lord, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, At the Cross, Joy to the world, just to name a few. Isaac Watts was a young man growing up in the Church of England when, when the hymns that were sung in the church actually were so different from the songs that were sung today that the rule and the basis of, of most of the hymns, the majority of the hymns that were sung in the church were based on the book of Psalms. And so every song that you sang was basically just a translation, an English translation of the book of Psalms. And so some of it was awkward, some of it didn't make a lot of sense, and, and trying to put melody to some of those words was, was quite difficult. And as Isaac Watts grew up in the home of a pastor and, and loved music, he began to write poems and write texts and, and write songs that people could sing, people could could love, and he did base a number of them off of the book of the Psalms, but, but he did something different. He was really the first person that wrote songs based upon Christian experience more than just based upon the Word. Joy to the World, written in 1719, 
was literally an interpretation of a scripture. It was Psalm 98. And if you want to turn in your Bible there, it's a, it's a wonderful psalm, a psalm of David. And he wrote Joy to the World as an interpretation of that, of that song. And I've got it on the screen here in a moment, but I'm going to read, I'm going to read this to you. And starting at verse 4 in Psalm 98. It says, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will judge the world in righteousness and peoples with equity. If you notice in the, in the words joy to the world in the song, there's, there's a lot of allusions that you find here in this passage of Scripture that but what you don't find in Joy to the World, you don't find any mention of shepherds or angels. You don't find any mention of wise men or, or really any other character that we would kind of combine or make part of the Christmas story. And, and the reason is, is because Isaac Watts did not write Joy to the World for Christmas. He actually wrote it for a whole different reason, for the coming of the Lord and His second coming. And so actually, Joy to the World probably is more of an Easter song. It's more of a resurrection song of Jesus has come back from the grave. But not just that, he is coming again. And it may not be a joyful time for all, but for those that know the Lord, when he comes back, even the rocks will sing out. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. About 100 years after Isaac Watts wrote the song, Lowell Mason took it in the tune that it was being sung to, this melody that a lot of people believe that Handel uh, wrote, uh, that, that he was one of the, the writers of it or the person it was based off of. And, and, and he took this and, and began to kind of develop it a little bit more into the song that we have today. And though it wasn't written as a Christmas carol, we can sure see that there's meaning when you think about a, a baby born in a manger who come who came as the Savior of the world, that, that we must prepare him room, the Scripture says, room in our hearts, that this is a joyous occasion. You know, whenever you hear it or sing it, uh, if we apply this to the Christmas story, we apply it to what God has done in Jesus Christ being born in a manger, we have cause to rejoice. And the lyrics uh, all point to the reason that Jesus came, to save the world, to save your sins and, and uh, or my sins, to save us, that we could live with him, and that he is coming again. Listen as we sing Joy to the World, as this ensemble sings it. And hear if you, see if you can hear the, the connection to Psalm 98. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior race. Let men their songs implore. While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy. 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 He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love 
and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. Joy to the world. Isn't that a great song? A beautiful song. And yet the world so often doesn't talk about joy, it talks about happiness. Because happiness is based upon our circumstances, what, what's happening to us. If things are going good and, and I'm experiencing blessing and, and, and I've got a lot of things, then I'm happy. But if I don't have those and, and things are a little tough and, and they're difficult, then I'm not happy. But joy is something completely different. Joy is a state of mind. Joy is a, is a sense in our heart, a well-being that God is present. And, and no matter what is happening on the outside, I can rejoice. Paul says it this way, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all that the Lord is near. Joy to the world. And why can we have joy? Because God has come. And yet so many people don't experience the joy that that God has for them. That joy is not just in our stuff or, or the things that we own or where we go or the position we have. It's in our relationship with God that we find real meaning and true joy. So the question really as we look at this song is how does joy come? How does God bring joy to our lives? How does he work it out in us that we learn and, and live in His joy, not just based on how things are going and, and happiness, but based on His presence and His work. And the song gives us some great insight. Four verses, four points. The first point is this. It's that joy comes when I receive my King. Joy comes when I receive my King. And, and, and it starts off, the first line says this, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sings. You see, when God comes in Christ, he brings joy. And the truth is, all of us, we have cravings in our life, just like our bodies crave air and, our, and, our, and, and we crave fruit, food and, and, we, and we crave comfort, so our spirit craves for God. And, and a wise man said that and until our hearts find rest in God, we find no rest. That there's an empty space in us that never can be filled with anything else. We're forever unsatisfied. We're empty until God comes and fills us with His joy. When you look at the Christmas story, there was great joy. And yet not everybody experienced joy. You read about King Herod, and King Herod, when the wise men came from the east, and they came to Jerusalem looking for this newborn king, this, this new world ruler. Herod was anything but joyful. Matter of fact, he was intimidated. He was frustrated. He was, he was upset he, because that somebody was kind of messing up his territory. He was concerned, and you know the story. The wise men came and they said, where can we find him who was born king of the Jews? And Herod began to question them. They'd followed a star and they'd come to Jerusalem looking for this, this baby, this, this, this baby that the stars foretold. And yet Herod didn't know anything about it. The Magi were joyful. They were excited, but not, but not Herod. I heard about a, a town in the south. It was a southern town and they, they had a beautiful nativity scene that somebody had spent quite a bit of effort and had a lot of uh, craftsman uh, skill and, and great talent to create. But there was one thing that was strange about this nativity scene. All of the, the wise men had firemen helmets on. And a visitor came through town and he, he looked at that and he was quite concerned and he tried to figure out how in the world they would have this nativity scene and they had these firemen helmets. And so as the as the visitor was leaving town, he stopped off at the quick stop on the way out of town and went up to the counter and, and asked the, the checkout lady, the lady behind the counter, about this nativity set. And, and, and he didn't understand why in the world they had these firemen, 
fireman hats on. And she, she got frustrated. She actually got mad, and she began to yell. And she said, you know good low-down Yankees. Don't you know anything about the Bible? And he said, well, I, you know, I've read the Bible, and I'm familiar with it, but I've never, I've never seen anything in there about firemen. So she pulled out a Bible from underneath the counter and flipped through it to the Gospel of Luke. And, and she pointed her, jabbed her finger at it and stuck it up in his face. Don't you see it? It says it right there. The wise men came from afar. <laughs> they were joyful. Herod, on the other hand, was paranoid. He was so paranoid that in time... During this time, he had actually put to, get, put to death three of his own children because he was afraid they were going to usurp the throne from him. He was so paranoid that, that he had the babies in Bethlehem that was foretold that this child, this king, would be born in Bethlehem. He had all of the children, male children, two years old and younger, put to death. Can you imagine the weeping and the, and the, the hurt there on that Christmas? It was not a joyful time for those mothers and those fathers. King Herod did not tolerate any rival king. You know, there's a similarity today. When you think of all the people that know Christ, and we're here worshiping God and celebrating his love, and yet how many people reject Jesus because he infringes on their own sovereignty? He, he, he comes in as the, the king, and he's a threat to their personal plans and their freedom or their passions or their greed or their pride. Jesus comes to set us free, and yet that's a freedom that we push back from. Joy comes, the Scripture says, and this song tells us, when I surrender myself to the real king, the rightful king. And the first line says this, let every heart prepare him room. Have you done that? Have you prepared him room? Have you made space? Have you opened up some, some area that, that he can reign in? Because joy comes when I make room for Christ in my life, when I give him the reign of my life, the sovereignty of who I am. You see, the wise men, they were different from Herod. Herod saw Jesus as a threat, and the wise men saw Jesus as a gift. A gift of new life and of possibility. And when they found him, Matthew tells us that they bowed down and worshipped him. The first point is joy comes when I, when I open my heart up and allow Christ to reign. The second point is this. Is joy comes when I, when I let the Savior reign. Not just when I welcome the king into my life, but when I let him reign. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat their sounding joy. You know, receiving Christ is the first step, is when I yield to him, and I, and I, but it doesn't stop there. It, it's not just saying, God, forgive me. It's having him reign in my life as that king. That while Jesus was living on earth, you know, a lot of people followed him. They, they, they were amazed at his miracles and his teaching, and, and, and a lot of people received him as king. But there weren't as many who gave up their lives and followed him and allowed him to reign in their lives. Matter of fact, when he called them to commitment, called them to accountability, the crowds began to thin out quite a bit. They chose to go their own way. And today, there are people that are willing to receive Christ, but having Him reign in their lives, having them take over the responsibility and the guidance and their entertainment choices and their careers and their, in their language, in their thought life and their image, they don't want Jesus to be in charge. They want to be in charge. I, I want to be in control. I want to make my own decisions. But if you try to receive Christ... Without letting him reign in your life, you miss out on the joy that God has for you. Because duplicity and hypocrisy confuses us and drains us of the joy and happiness that God has for us. And the truth is God made us. He, he formed us. He created us in our mother's womb. And he knows what gives us joy and what can 
give us joy. He knows how he made us for what we, we do in our careers. He knows how he made us for who we are in relationship with and who we marry. That joy really is a byproduct of obedience. That when I obey him and follow him, then, then I receive his joy. When I say, God, I'm going to let you be God in my life. I'm, I, I know you're the God of the universe, but I'm going to let you direct my universe, my life. Every step. That's what it means to let Jesus reign. You be the CEO, the manager, the, the general uh, manager, the, not only of the entire universe, but of my universe. You know me better than I know myself. And I obey you. I follow you. How obedient are you? That when you sense God leading and God's word says, here's where to go and how to do it and what to do, do you follow that? Do you say, yes, Lord? Are, are you like those who go their own way to say, no, I'm going to be the Lord of my own life? Or are you those that say, I want you to be my Lord. Reign in me. So joy comes when I receive the king and joy comes when I let the Savior reign. The third point is this. Joy comes when I confess my sin, and not only my sin, but his holiness. Listen to this third stanza. No more let sins and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Let me do a survey real quick. How many of you have ever sinned? Just raise your hand. Well, there's a few saints in here, probably about... Oh, about 60% of you have sinned. The rest of you, you know, then you don't even need to pay attention to this. Those of you that have sinned, let me ask you this. Why do you sin? Why, why do you sin? Why, why, why have you made those choices when you say, God says this, but I'm going to do this. I, I know it's wrong. I'm going to willfully do something else. Why do, you, why do you do that? What the Bible teaches us is we sin because we believe it will bring us happiness. We believe that if we make this certain decision, I'm going to be happier than I am now. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. God says, don't eat of the fruit of this tree. And yet the certain serpent comes along and says, ah, he doesn't, he's not telling you the truth. If you eat of that, you are really going to know it all. You're going to be wise. You're going to be happy. And, you know, you think about every sin that comes along and every temptation you have, and the whole goal of that is if, if I do this, it will make me happy. And the truth is, sin does provide happiness, but only for a season. I liked how one pastor, uh, Craig Rochelle, I like a lot of his books and, and some of our classes of study. He, said, uh, he says, you know, sin is like a sneeze. It feels good at first, but then it leaves a huge mess. That's kind of, kind of a slimy joke, isn't it? You think about that sin. It, it, oh, it just, oh, I feel so much better, but oh, my God. You know, ugh, yeah. And that's the way sin is. It, it feels good at first, but it's the ramifications. It's the... The overflow, the outflow, it promises happiness, but what it delivers is ultimate sorrow. You know, you look at Adam and Eve, and, and they, they were told, God said, here's the deal, be obedient. Here's, here's the plan, follow me. Here's the, here's the guidelines, don't eat of this fruit. And, and, and Adam and Eve decided, no, I'm going to do it my own way and, because I know what will make me happy. And, and so they ate the fruit, and I have no doubt the fruit tasted wonderful. It was very satisfying. For a moment, sin has pleasure, but, but in the end, it leads to destruction, the Scripture says. Sin promised happiness, but what did it deliver? It delivered a curse. It delivered a, a lifetime of regret. And, and the Scripture says, or this verse says this, he, can, he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. You see, where there's sin, there ultimately is curse. Curse in a family, curse in an individual, curse in life. And whenever a sinner repents, on the other hand, there is great joy. There's rejoicing in heaven. But, but I look at this verse, and, and, and what a powerful verse. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. 
He's talking about repentance. Uh, repentance, metanoia in the Greek, literally says, I'm going to change my mind. The way I was looking at what I was doing, I really felt like I was going to get a certain result from it. But I have a change of mind when I repent, and I look at what I do from God's eyes, and I see the world not through my own selfishness and my own pride and my own desire, but I see it through His will and my obedience to His will and through His word. And all of a sudden, instead of of just seeing things the way I see it, I have a mind shift. I see it different. I choose to agree with God. I, I change my mind to agree with Him. That that I agree with him that the outcome of what I could do here will lead to destruction, will lead to cursing, not to blessing. Oh, it may, be, it may look good on the surface, but I realize in the long run, it's not going to get me to where I'm going to go. It's not going to get me the result that I really want to get. That's Repentance. And what happens too often is we rationalize or, or maybe we have a false repentance where we say, God, forgive me. And we, we say, God, forgive me because we get caught or, or somebody points it out to us. And, and, or maybe we feel a little guilty, but, but we haven't changed our mind about what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're not looking at it the way God looks at it because we still believe if we do these things, it will make us happy. It will just meet my need, even if it's for a moment and we miss we miss the whole point no more let sins and sorrow grow nor thorns infest the ground but he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found we believe that when when we sense the holy spirit speak to us and he convicts us of sin and and and, you know i think this is a good reminder for all of us when the holy spirit comes to you he comes to me The Holy Spirit does not condemn. The Holy Spirit convicts. When I feel condemnation, that's not of God. When I feel conviction, that's the Holy Spirit. Condemnation says you're no good. You're lousy. You just need to be thrown away. Nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. Nobody wants you. That's condemnation. Conviction says you were wrong, and you need to make it right. God loves you. He cares about you, but you're going the wrong way. You're making bad decisions, and it needs to stop now. That's conviction. Conviction says, I'm breaking the heart of God, and I'm literally breaking my life into pieces because I'm not following his will. And when I repent, when I change my mind, when I go a different direction, and I confess my sins, and I receive that forgiveness, all of a sudden, I'm on a different course. But you notice what the song says, no more let sins and sorrow grow nor thorns infest the ground. That, it's, that there's something beyond just saying, God, forgive me, and I receive that forgiveness, but it's also living in that forgiveness. It's, it's what the second part of it is. I confess my sin, but I also confess His holiness. That He, the Holy Spirit, God, the Spirit of Christ, can so indwell me and help me and work in me and cleanse me that I no longer have to let sin and sorrow grow in my life. I no longer have to let thorns infest the ground. I know we hear it all the time. We sin every day, word, thought, and deed. Some people say, well, I understand that. I mean, all of us are sinners, we're, we're told. And yet, the Scripture says that we're called not to sin, not to live where sins and, and sorrows grow. It, it, there's not a seed bed. There's not a place for it to live and, and expand, nor let the thorns infest the ground. What do you do when you have thorns and weeds in your yard? You go pull them out. Oh, yeah, there'll be some others that grow up because there's some seeds, right? But when they come up, do you just say, well, you know, I already pulled the, the first one. I'm not going to pull the rest of them. No, you keep pulling them, and, you, and then all of a sudden the lawn is so healthy, and because of what you put in there to strengthen that lawn, it begins to kill the weeds out itself. But every so often you got to go pull a weed. It's the same in our lives. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. That when we yield ourselves to Christ, when we confess our sins and receive His forgiveness, we can be made holy because He is holy. That His Spirit lives within us, that we no longer have to yield 
to sin. What a challenge for you and me. Can you go a minute without sinning? Think about it. Can you? Can you go five minutes without? What, what is sin? Sin is a willful transgression against a known law of God. Can you go ten minutes without sinning? That you say, God, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to obey. Can you go an hour without sinning? How about a day or a week or a month or a year? Do you know the Scripture actually says that we don't have to allow sin and sorrow to grow. We don't have to allow the thorns to infest our ground. We can live in His holiness. We can live in His strength because His Spirit so lives in us that we live in a repentant lifestyle that we're no longer thinking, we're no longer choosing that direction, we're choosing His direction. And yeah, are we, because we have a bent towards sin, I understand, because we have a challenge, we live in this fallen world, sure, there's opportunities and there's challenges. Just like 1 John says, I write these things to you, children, that you may not sin. I like that. I write these things so we can say that, you know what, the truth is we don't have to continue to sin. Does that mean we haven't sinned? No. It means we don't have to continue sin. But then he goes on, he says the next verse. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But don't sin. But if you do, but don't. 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 But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, but don't. And so, God, forgive me. Come into my life. Work in me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Cleanse my heart. Sanctify me wholly that I'm not bound and controlled by the spirit, the the bent of sin, that I'm controlled by following you. And my whole heart's desire and will is to please you and to honor you and to live in you. That's the reason we offer repentance opportunities at the end of every service. That's the reason we, uh, we ask you to, to search your heart and, and allow God to come in and, and, and change you. Not because we sin all the time and we can't help but sinning, but, but because we constantly want to stay in relationship and contact with God. And we can so love Him that love pervades and, and overwhelms us that we don't want to disappoint Him and sin anymore. Oh, I've sinned, and, and I tell you what, it's terrible. As a Christian, how it grieves the heart of God. And I don't want to do that. Are there places of frailty and failure and misjudgment? Yes. But you don't have to live there. Because we have an advocate with the Father. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. But we receive His blessing far as the curse is found. That's amazing, the theology of that. It's right there out of Psalm 98 and right through the Word. There's a story written back in the 1800s. It's it's an Old West story, and it was written by a man by the name of of Bret Hart. And he wrote a story called The Luck of Roaring Camp. It was published in 1868, and it's a fascinating story. I read read it as a kid, the the Western stories. And Roaring Camp was was, uh, considered the meanest, toughest, uh, just the most low-down mining town in the West. There were more murders per capita than any other mining town on record of the day. And it's reported that thefts were all around. Roaring Camp was a, was a place that was rough, it was raw, and it was inhabited by all men, except for one woman. And she made her living the only way she knew how to make it, as you can imagine. Her name was Cherokee Sal. Cherokee Sal, uh, after some time, became pregnant and gave birth to a little girl, but died in childbirth. And these men who were there in this mining town gathered around this brand new baby and didn't know what to do. And so they picked up the baby and got an old box and put the baby in a box and tried to take care of it the best they could. And they had rags. That's all they had. It was just a dirty old place. And as the men looked there in that box, they they saw that they needed to do better for this baby. And so somebody rode 80 miles away and bought a rosewood cradle and brought it back. They set the baby in that rosewood cradle. And and as they set the baby in with those old rags all around it, they they said, this is not going to do. And so somebody else rode the opposite direction and brought back a bunch of silk and lace to wrap the baby in. And when they put the silk and lace around the baby, they, they looked and they saw how filthy, dirty that room was, the floor and the walls and the windows. And so 
those rough and raw men got on their hands and knees and began to scrub. And they cleaned that room and they cleaned the walls and the ceiling and the windows and they it just, you wouldn't recognize it. Before. They even got curtains and put on the wall. I mean, it was a whole different place. And as the baby grew, the men took more care of her and would take her to the entrance to the mine every day in the good weather and, and, and so they could come out on breaks and see this little baby. And they could bring her little stones and things. And, and as they would come out, they would look back at the mine and they saw how dirty and filthy it was. And so they began to plant bushes and trees and, and plant flowers and clean up the whole area of the mine. And it just changed the whole complexion of the town. As they brought those stones back and they would set the stones next to the baby and the baby would play with these shiny pieces of metal, these precious gems and, 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 and uh, metals, they saw how filthy, dirty their hands were. And how rugged they were. And so the general store sold out of soap and, and washcloths and, and shampoo. And all of a sudden, that whole town was different. Because a baby came. A baby changed the lives of all those men. A baby came in Bethlehem. And changed not just the lives of a few people gathered there. But literally changed the world. And when we think of this song, we think of joy to the world, the question is, has the Bethlehem baby changed our lives? Is our life different? Because when we repent and receive His holiness, it's no longer the way it was. We don't live, the, we're transformed, we're, we're different people. It's a small picture of the change that God brings to our life in Christ. The fourth verse goes on to say this. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. You see, joy comes when I live in truth and grace. That's what God brings in Christ. That when he lives in me, it lives out of me. Joy comes because Jesus comes and rules with the perfect balance of truth and grace. And we need both, don't we? Have you ever been around somebody that's really truthful but did not have a lot of grace? And they just kind of say, well, I'll just tell you the way it is, or they told you the way it was. And the truth is that truth brought more offense than it did grace. And you have to balance it. If it's a boss or if it's a spouse or if it, whoever it is, we need to balance truth and grace. It needs to be seasoned with grace. I, I like what someone said Truth without love is dogmatism. Love without truth is sentimentality. But truth with love, that's true Christianity. Jesus brings joy and he balances truth and grace. There was a man, I heard about a dad who found a way to kind of mix truth and grace together. It was the Christmas season and his family had put together a nativity in their front yard and it was a beautiful nativity and, and all of the, the children helped do it. And, and the last thing was Scott came running out of the house and, and he had this blow up gigantic green Tyrannosaurus Rex. And he put the Tyrannosaurus Rex right behind the manger. And dad stepped back and kind of looked at it and said, Scott, now that's probably not going to work because, you know, there were no dinosaurs at the time Jesus was alive. And, and there were no kind of fierce figures like this, no Tyrannosaurus Rexes. And it's really out of place in the nativity scene. Scott began to cry and his dad kind of backed down a little bit and say, well, okay, maybe we can, we'll just leave it up for a while. And he stepped back and the family looked there at that nativity set and the, and the story talks about how dad, all of a sudden as he stood back and he looked, he realized that maybe the dinosaur says more than, than he thought. For over each of us, he says, is a menacing character that threatens to rob us of all our joy and our peace and our hope. But Christmas reminds us that a baby born in a manger is stronger than all the dinosaurs of the world in your life or my life. That God has given us victory through the gift of his son. That joy comes with his truth and his grace. 
I think that's what John was writing about in Revelation chapter 12. And I put it at the bottom of your outline. I won't read it. But he, he writes about this heavenly drama going on where this woman has this baby that is born and there's a dragon. The, the beast is there. And yet, God protects this child to be this leader, this provider of joy. That true joy comes when I receive Christ. That's joy to the world. Joy not based on what happens to me, but joy based on what God is doing in me and through me. That joy comes when I receive Christ and I invite him to reign in my life. Joy comes when I repent of my sin and, and, and accept his holiness. Joy comes when I live in his truth and grace. And beyond all the packages and, and all the decorations and presents, the real cause of joy is that the Lord has come. Father, we thank you today that we can live in that joy. It doesn't have to end on December 26th after the decorations begin to come down and the lights are turned off and the Christmas cells move into the New Year cells that can live every day of our lives. When we, when we receive you as the king of our life, when you reign as Savior in us and through us, when we confess our sin, but also your holiness, when we live in your truth and your grace. Father, I pray that this truth of Christmas would work in our lives and that the people gathered here today to celebrate your love in Jesus Christ that over the next few minutes, we would just be honest with you. And we would open up our lives to make room in our hearts for the King of Kings. To reign in us. To forgive us. To cleanse us. To fill us. To empower us. And then to use us to spread joy. Not just happiness. But joy to the world. What do you sense the Holy Spirit saying to you today? How do you need to experience more joy this new year? What is it that's holding you back from living in the joy that Christ has for you? What What's the first step that you sense the Holy Spirit directing you to take that can change that? On this last Sunday, have you, have you said, Lord Jesus, be my King. Lord Jesus, be my Savior. Lord Jesus, forgive me and reign in my heart and my life. Fill me with your presence. Sanctify me through and through to be holy to you as you are holy. And then live in me through truth and grace. To be a world changer where you've put me. Stand with me, would you? Father, how we yield to you this day. And if there's any here today, and I believe there are, that need to say to you, Lord Jesus, I'm here. Work in me and through me. I yield my life to you. Savior and Lord. Redeemer and sanctifier. This year is going to be different because I trust in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me new life. Thank you for coming to me and to this world and sending me out to spread that joy. In Jesus' name, amen.